Hey everybody, welcome to a new episode of Podcast with Avash. Uh, if you're new to the channel, we talk about different amazing guests with incredible stories and try to learn some things from those. And if you are new to this channel, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. All the informations are going to be on our description below. And as I said, we talk with incredible people. And for today's guest, I have Mr. Yadav Kimire. He's a conservation biologist in Nepal. Hello, Yadav. There. And uh, he, like he's a conservation biologist in Nepal, and he works, uh, he's affiliated with the NGO Friends of Nature. And welcome to the show, Dai. Welcome, welcome to our podcast with Avash. Hello. Well, thank you. Uh, let's uh, let's start with this. Let's start with French of Nature. You are affiliated with it, but I've never heard of it. So, can you give me a little bit description of what it is? Sure. Uh, French of Nature is an NGO. It was established by young pe- people like me. I was very young back then when we established it. So it was in two thousand five. So nearly one and a half decades. Uh, and uh, we basically work uh, in the field of wildlife research and wildlife conservation. So we do a lot of work. Uh, so people who are uh, not updated with uh, in this field or uh, people who are not uh, in Nepal, mm-hmm. so they m- might not have heard about it. Otherwise, uh, people who are in Nepal and who uh, try to get updated with uh, news about wildlife research and conservation, they are, uh, they know about uh, Friends of Nature. Okay. Uh, uh, we do so, a lot of research and conservation work. Yeah. So this is actually, you uh, You are the founding member of the this. Uh, okay. I was not a founding member, uh, our friends, but I was in the group okay. uh, of uh, people who founded uh, Friends of Nature. Yeah, I this, joined uh, one year later. Okay. I mean, this uh, organization definitely feels like uh, since it was founded, like in 2005, as you said, it's a pretty old organization. And uh, like for us, like uh, I am in, in, I've been in States, uh, but I, it's like, I've not heard of those organizations because, because there are na- many different organizations, but these are like so important kind of organizations to help con- for the conservation of uh, like wildlife and uh, flora and fauna in Nepal. So, uh, like, what made you, like, uh, join this organization? Uh, it, it was not, uh, not that I, I thought that I would uh, join this organization. It was all, um, I don't know how to put it, but uh, uh, we had to do a thesis at the end of our master's. Uh, and I was a bit confused when uh, when we had to do the thesis. I I, I didn't know what, uh, which topic to choose and uh, what to do. I was new to this field. Actually, my bachelor's uh, is in uh, physics. Mm-hmm. I had uh, my BSc in physics. So, and I did my master's in environment. So that, that was a quite U-turn uh, in terms of uh, academic uh, uh, thing. So, and I didn't know about properly about uh, uh, how to carry out a thesis because we we didn't have to do anything uh, in our bachelors and uh, i didn't know about grants uh, i didn't know that uh, some organizations or agencies or even uh, corporates they would uh, uh, offer grant for people who carry uh, research on certain uh, topics i didn't know about all those uh, things so i was confused and uh, one of my friends, he, we work together uh, at Friends of Nature now. Uh, his name is Raju Acharya, so he is executive director. Uh, so he offered me uh, some uh, monetary support uh, for carrying out a thesis, but I had to do a uh, thesis on human leopard conflict in Mustang district. So that was his term. So if you carry out uh, your thesis in human leopard conflict in Mustang district, I can offer you some monetary support so that you don't have to uh, put uh, money from your uh, pocket uh, for carrying out your thesis. So I said, okay, that's that's very nice. So, and 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 we carried out uh, that work in 2006. It was in 2006. Uh, I carried out my thesis, and since then I never felt like I had to leave this field. So I I felt that I belonged to this field. So I never. 
never ever thought of leaving this field so that that was how i uh, joined this field you joined the uh, friends of nature but uh, like uh, the way as you framed it like uh, friends of nature is basically a conservation uh, organization for nepal, uh, nepal. Uh, is it like a flora or fauna or like uh, can you describe more about the works of uh, this organization uh we mostly work with uh, mammals and birds so if 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 i'd like to say something about our current work mm -hmm. i'll i'll just tell you some some of the works we are carrying out right now sure uh annually we we uh, organize one festival called nepal owl festival owl o w l owl mm -hmm. uh so we we are carrying out that festival since 2012 so in 2020 we uh, organized that festival in Xiangza district mm. in in central uh, central west nepal uh, so that was the ninth edition so during that festival what we do is we try to uh, look for a new area because we we carry we organize that festival every year in a different district in nepal so what our initial plan was we we will carry out this festival organize this festival in seven, 75 back then it was 75 districts so we thought we will organize festival each year in different district so in 75 years we'll organize this festival in all of these districts of nepal that was uh, our plan and it, it has worked uh, quite well till now this year we uh, did it in uh, Xiangza in February 2020. So what we do is we, we don't organize that festival in uh, urban areas. So we don't look for cities. We don't look for towns. So we, we look for villages and we try to look for new villages and try to go there, meet people, talk with them, mm -hmm. uh, whether they are really interested in uh, in these uh, organizing this festival are they so, interested uh, in conservation like, uh, just to, just and, to be clear uh, about the festival like uh, what is the festival and uh, yeah. as i said like uh, i was asking about the uh, friends of nature organization so their main objective is for the festival uh, and they do other things as well right so uh, i'm just trying to get we, clarification like we, uh, we do other things also this is just huh? This, this is just uh, one of our activities, okay. one activity we do. So this festival is one. Then we have like, we also do work on clouded leopard uh, research and conservation. Recently we have, uh, we have a project on clouded leopard conservation. Uh, we, we have, uh, we do that in uh, central Nepal. So okay. Annapurna conservation area. North Central Nepal. Uh, what we do is we work with students mm -hmm. and local people. We organize uh, conservation awareness camps for them, uh, and then we produce conservation materials like posters, booklets, brochures, which uh, which has the message on clouded leopard conservation for people. Uh, we organize training for local people. Uh, like forest firefighting training, nature guide training, uh, and uh, then we also uh, prepare radio programs for general mass for the awareness, uh, and we organize uh, eco trips like hiking for students. Uh, we take them to forest. Uh, we make them uh, identify uh, these signs of animals uh, we tell them uh, which animal uh, lives in which kind of habitat uh, we provide them binoculars books uh, we do bird watching for them so all all this uh, stuff not just the festival okay so basically from what i as a like someone who does not know about your organization and just getting a hint of it the your like friends of nature is basically an educational uh, organization who 
like uh, organizes different types of festivals, uh, involves a lot of students and involves a lot of people to get educated about the environment of Nepal in different areas. And you, as you said, you, you've been, uh, the OWL festival is, you're trying to get it throughout the, all the districts, right? Yeah, so from, uh, from uh, I'm just getting like, uh, trying to get uh, to understand what that organization yeah. is, because like uh, this, sure. as you said, like you, once you get inside the, like inside the conservation uh, area, like, a, no, I would not say area, once you get inside the, when you go into wildlife field, there's so many different things. There's education and like uh, even from the way we were taught as uh, children, like uh, when we were in younger students, we can go into understanding about uh, like wildlife protection, getting education, getting students to volunteer here and there, and uh, you being involved in uh, as a con conservation biologist, uh, it's a very interesting spot for you to be. I, I know you are like uh, you are you work uh, work mostly for conservation rather than like do you do marketing side or do you do like educational for students as well or do you do more in the research side? Uh, both. Okay. Both. Uh, we do, like I, I uh, just told you about uh, our work on uh, making students and uh, local people aware mm -hmm. on uh, different species, their importance, uh, and even training them, uh, building their capacity. Uh, and, but we also do research. In 2017, uh -huh. uh, we used camera traps you know, uh, motion sensor camera traps, which we leave in the forest and, and they take pictures of wildlife there. Uh, all uh, species like leopards and clouded leopards and black deer and deers, uh, martens and ev everything. Uh, and we, we left the camera traps in the field for like three months. And we looked at the data uh, in that area, in Annapurna conservation area, mm -hmm. uh, in the lower part of Annapurna Conservation Area, we recorded around at least four uh, clouded leopards, uh, around 11 leopards. So we, we do research also, and we, are, we also publish uh, articles uh, based on this data. Uh, and recently, just yesterday only, yes, uh, we were offered a grant uh, from an organization called Panthera, it's okay. it's a it's an organization based in US and uh, they they fund uh, research and conservation activities uh, for cat species okay like leopard clouded leopard tiger lions so these are cat species so they they fund uh, for activities like research and conservation on cat species so we were yesterday only we uh, i got an email uh, that we are uh, being awarded a grant for carrying out a research, uh, which, and the objective of that research is uh, looking at the density, density of clouded leopard mm -hmm. in Annapurna conservation area. So we will carry the population density, we'll estimate the population density of clouded leopard in the same area, Annapurna conservation area. Mm -hmm. And we'll also uh, look at the diet from their, their poo, poo, you know. So uh, we'll collect the poo, clouded <laughs> leopard's poo, and then uh, we identify mm -hmm. because each uh, scat they have like this DNA, mm -hmm. DNA, you know. So uh, so we can identify the individual clouded leopard from their scat, uh, and from based on that information, we'll uh, estimate their density population in that area, and then we'll also carry out like. Uh, if a cloudy leopard eats something, then the fur, fur hairs of that animal, the prey animal, will also be in its poop. So okay. we'll try to uh, look at what the cloudy leopard is eating. Okay. So uh, I guess like a first congratulations on getting like uh, the grant for like a uh, oh, okay. research and so on. Like, of course, as you are, as everybody knows, getting grants for especially like uh, environment. Uh, and environmental research or anything related to, to nature and so on is pretty difficult. And uh, like help, getting those grants helps out to get uh, more information so that you could preserve more like animals and uh, protect the environment by getting more research, I guess. 
but uh, like uh, as you said, like uh, I remember you said like uh, you talked a little bit about uh, owls and festival, but like we'll we'll get back to it again. But uh, the clouded leopard is an interesting thing, as you said. You for you it's just like normal. You just talk about clouded leopard, and we'll just collect poo. We'll just uh, research uh, like how many are there, population density, and you said you were researching on the Annapurna, Annapurna, uh, what area was there? Annapurna conservation area. Annapurna yeah. conservation area. So uh, basically your, uh, your grant or what, uh, like your research is on that, my bad, and that side of the uh, reservation area, only uh, Annapurna or do you have multiple places as well? So right now we are only working uh, in con Annapurna conservation area. Area. We have plans. Uh, we have plans to expand our work, expand our research, expand our conservation work in other parts of Nepal also. Mm -hmm. But right now, uh, we are focusing on underground conservation. Area so uh, at this, the moment, yeah, just to get like uh, our audience a little bit more background on uh, like your research. So uh, you like uh, as you're being a part of the Friends of uh, Nature NGO. Like how, before we even go into cloud, cloud dilemma, I want to make this a little bit uh, better understanding is your organization has, uh, like do they work with some kind of like a location wise, like how you would be able to make those research or how, how is those contracts usually go? Because as you said, you were working on the Annapurna site, but uh, you don't actually own the uh, like the contract to make those research. How does that work with your uh, like NGO? Uh, 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 I think I need uh, to hear that question once okay, uh, again. Because I, I have had a talk with my other friends, like they always have problem getting a site to make a research on. So I was just curious about Friends of Nature, okay. how do they usually go about to find a location to do the research? Okay, 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 uh, okay, uh, I got you. <clears throat> it depends, it depends a lot. Uh, as an organization, what we do is we try to uh, explore uh, the areas which uh, have not been explored. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, that that's one 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 box which we uh, would like to tick. Mm -hmm. And then another is uh, easy access also, like Annapurna conservation area. Uh, one of my friends, I think I told uh, his name. A little while ago, Raju Acharya, mm -hmm. who we worked together. So he he worked as uh, as an employee in Annapurna Conservation Area Project. So which which manages Annapurna Conservation Area. So mm -hmm. he worked uh, in that area and previously. So he has a very good uh, rapport with uh, local people there and all agencies. So that's. That for uh, to work in Annapurna conservation area, it's easier for us, and uh, but but that's not the only reason. But we should also have like uh, we also like to work on species which are not not uh, not uh, much uh, studied by others. So clouded leopard. Let's let's say uh, for example, clouded leopard. There's not many people working on clouded leopards in Nepal. Uh, to be very honest, I think uh, the person who is working on clouded leopard for like, let's say six, seven, eight years back, it's, it's only me. Nobody uh, has worked on clouded leopard for so long. Somebody tries to uh, do research for one project and then he or she leaves. So that, that's what is the problem. So we look at the species, so uh, if like we don't work in tigers, we don't don't work on tigers because there are so many people working on tigers already. So we don't just like to uh, populate uh, that that uh, aspect. So uh, clouded leopard, nobody has worked. Annapurna conservation area, we know that clouded leopard are there. Okay. So that's how uh, we do. And and then we have like good connections with uh, local agencies there. So three three box. Uh, take okay, so, and we we go to the Annapurna. So, uh, like uh, as you said, you have worked uh, regarding like you have made more research on clouded leopard. Uh, just to like um, I remember the clouded leopard being one of the icon of the Sark Games, like a long time, long long time ago. Uh, like 
I don't know. I was back home, like back in Nepal, like that. It must be about 15 years ago when we had uh, Nepal had SARC games. Clouded Leopard was one of the a mascot of it, and uh, I, I don't quite remember. I think it was it was Snow Leopard. My bad. <laughs> Is it Snow Leopard and Clouded Leopard different, right? Yeah, different. Different, different species. Okay, I got I got mixed up, but it was at least the leopard. So clouded yeah, leopard. That's, that's fine. That's fine. And what is clouded leopard? Like, uh, is it a unique species? Not a unique species, but like, is it only found in Nepal, or like, is it more common type of leopard? So uh, it's it's a very interesting species, uh, clouded leopard. It's uh, based on its size, mm -hmm. uh, like. For cat species, like uh, we know domestic cat, everybody knows, isn't it? The feral cats, the cats which move around our houses. And uh, and uh, so these domestic cat and tiger, the big tiger, they are like very much related. They, even There's even a uh, uh, myth in uh, ne Nepali language that uh, the domestic cat is the maternal uncle of tiger so <laughs> that's that's a very common story isn't it so uh, scientifically also they are very related Bo both are cat species mm. so there are some some features which uh, which differentiate cat species uh, from others like if we look at their uh, paw uh -huh. so they they have these claws cat species have claws yeah. dogs also have claws but uh, but what ca what differentiate them is cats can uh, retract their claws. So while walking, they don't they don't uh, they have Chip claws away. concealed. Yeah. Nobody can see their claws. Okay. So, but when they are like uh, hunting mm -hmm. or they are attacking something, they they take out their claws and uh, use them. But yeah. dogs dogs they cannot do that like that. Dogs have open claws. Okay, and so that's what uh, differentiate uh, cat species from dog species. Okay, so we have twelve species of uh, cats in Nepal. Uh, like tiger is one; yeah. everybody knows tigers, and even leopards. Everybody knows uh, leopards, and snow leopard. It's also uh, like very famous. Yeah. Uh, uh, but clouded leopard is one which is like very few uh, people know about uh, clouded leopard. Uh, the size wise it is smaller than tiger leopard and snow leopard it's around 20 20 around 20 kgs heavier ones uh, but they have kg. very unique adaptations so uh, very unique. Uh, yeah. so you said 20 kgs for like a, a clouded leopard right compare that to a tiger around, yeah. what what is a tiger weigh tiger's 200 plus 200 plus so it's like 10 times <laughs> Tigers are ten times ten bigger. Times, yeah. Ten so times. clouded leopard almost feels like a house yeah. cat. Cl clouded uh, leopard, yeah. like a yeah, it's 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 like a domestic dog. A domestic dog. Oh, so is it bigger than a? Yeah. How how big? Like I'm just trying to get the comparison. Like how big is it uh, to the regular feral cat? Feral cat could be like somewhere around uh, three, four, four, five kg. Oh. Around uh, three to four times. Bigger. Okay, so it's like a regular cat's like three, four kg. The clouded leopard's like twenty kg, and the tiger's like two hundred kg. Yeah. So that's, that's a, like so whole, it's a, yeah. Log, log yeah, spectrum. Uh, log in the and, in in the research of like a log way, it's just like in the medium. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like. So uh, uh, yeah, and they have uh, some some very unique adaptations, clouded leopard. Uh, -huh. uh two three i'll i'll just uh tell you about uh two or three features one is uh their very long tail mm. uh they have around uh the length of their tail is equal to the length of their body oh very long tail so they live mostly in trees they are arboreal they they can climb trees like monkeys it's very expert so they live in, in trees so the long tail they need for the balance oh. one feature and another is we know the canine teeth yeah even canine we, have, teeth, we have them too right the the kukuridat we call it yeah. 
yeah yeah so the canine teeth they have it's very long like two inch it's like a saber like saber tiger kind of thing. kind of yeah, yeah. so uh, the tiger when we talked about tiger tiger also have around the same length like two inch two and a half inch mm -hmm. but clouded leopard being 10 times smaller has the oh. same same uh, length of uh, canine so probably that is uh, if it it also hunts while it is in trees so it needs to get hold of its prey species pretty tightly otherwise it might uh, fall so maybe that is uh, one reason why its uh, canine teeth is so long and then mm -hmm. the third adaptation is uh, we have this what what is this called ankle uh, ankles are used for leg and uh, wrist the wrist wrist okay yeah. Ankle is the leg, leg, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so the hind leg, uh -huh. hind leg of clouded leopard, the ankle bone, it can rotate. It's like let's say this is clouded leopard leg. Uh -huh. It can rotate its ankle like back like this. Okay, I can't, I can't put up the image in my head, but I'll try to research those. <laughs> but like, so those are not just okay. You go like, give your description. How how, yeah. how does that work? Because that that helps uh, when it uh, tries to climb down from tree. Oh. So it, it needs that. So so to get get the hold of the trunk. Okay. By rotating its ankle. Okay, that's a really interesting feature because uh, like we always know like a lot of species of animals whenever they go downhill say they are not really used to they are really good at going uphill but downhill they are not really good good at it like uh, say rhino and other like a uh, like big uh, elephant or so on uh, it's it's really hard to go downhill so like especially for the arboreal uh, clouded leopard it's a uh, they have like a genetically uh, completely different type of uh, skeleton uh, structure yeah so they, they they can climb down head first Huh. easily because of that that uh, that that adaptation in their uh, ankle bone okay so that's that's really yeah, yeah, interesting so like, this that, species is really unique yeah if uh, if i say like the powder leopard is after you to kill you you can't run up the tree or run down the tree it will get you uh, because cloud leopard it uh, there's very there's not even uh, in nepal there's not even a single instance of clouded leopard attacking human uh, so it's it's pretty small domestic dog okay. so it it basically is uh, uh, it's a very shy animal mm -hmm. it doesn't like to uh, get close to human settlement uh, and it's not big enough to uh, like attack a human without provocation so okay. I I'd, I'd uh, like to add that word without provocation. It it might attack when if it's cornered or if if somebody is after it. Otherwise, it's not big enough to attack a human and kill it. Yeah, just to let people them. know, so, like even if you corner a small regular house cat, they can be really dangerous. So like uh, yeah 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 of course yeah. and cloud clouded leopard of course will uh, defend itself. But uh, as you said, like uh, the clouded leopard. Uh, in how many countries are they found in? Clouded leopard is found in, um, I have to count. <laughs> so uh, Nepal is the westernmost, Nepal is the westernmost country uh, where clouded leopard are found. So clouded leopard is found uh, eastwards from Nepal. So Nepal, India, Bhutan, okay. Bangladesh, China, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Malaysia. Okay. Uh, uh, eleven. I can come up with right now. Yeah, and like, bang. Uh, yeah, is it 11, is it like an endangered 11, species? Uh, so there's an organization which uh, categorizes these uh, species, mm -hmm. uh, whether they are endangered or uh, critically endangered. So it is called IUCN. Most of people they have heard about IUCN. Maybe you have heard about IUCN. So what they do is they try to uh, contact experts from uh, each range countries, each countries where these species are found, and they try to assess the status, like how it, they are doing, what could be the population in each country, and based on all those information, they they uh, try to categorize its uh, status. So right now uh, they are uh, vulnerable. So it's okay. a vulnerable. different category, okay. vulnerable, vulnerable. So 
if if the threats that are uh, acting on these species, if they are still threatened and still kill like they are being killed now, over time they will become endangered. Okay. So, so, uh, right. so one criteria to 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 make people understand one criteria, just one criteria. We have like Ayushin has like five criteria to assess a species uh, status. Mm -hmm. So one criteria which most people can understand, I'll tell. So it's the population size. Mm -hmm. uh, so if globally, if a species has less than 10,000 population, then it is vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So cloudy leopard, they are not uh, like, they have like less than 10,000 uh, across the world. Okay, that's a that's a pretty the low, I guess, uh, for the leopards. Yeah. For, so, uh, like uh, with your research, like uh, when you say you, as you said, you have worked with uh, cloud regarding cloud and leopard for about five six years. So, uh, you have done a lot of research. But when you go about like uh, for any researchers in Nepal, what do what kind of data do they usually collect to uh, to make it a legitimate research in that sense? Like it would help the community of uh, like getting uh, those knowledge out so that others uh, like other organizations or environmentalists can uh, gain the data to make it use of it some way like what how does your research usually work in your field right now in nepal most uh, people or most organization we use camera traps okay. at the moment uh, but it also depends upon species like let's say if we want to research on bats mm -hmm then camera traps won't work. Okay. So they have different, uh, but if when we uh, talk about uh, species like cats, species, dog species like fox, jackals, uh, and others, then we mostly use camera traps. We leave them uh, in the forest. Mm -hmm. uh, there's particular uh, specific method how to, you, how to put those uh, camera traps in the forest. We, how do we choose the sites? All those we have uh, like a proper system, mm -hmm. uh, but we leave them in a uh, forest and then uh, we can change the batteries. If the batteries run out uh, early, then we, we have to change them, uh, change the memory cards if it's full. So we have to mm -hmm. monitor the camera traps. And from, uh, from those, once we uh, do the camera trapping, then we get uh the image mm -hmm. of those pieces and in those images we get the time okay. time stamp temperature moon phase all those information will be uh, on those images and based on that time we can uh we can check whether clouded leopard or common leopard use the same area at the same time or different time okay and how how uh, how whether the same area is used by a clouded leopard or a common leopard, whether they avoid each other or not, we oh. can come up with uh, the numbers of clouded leopard, numbers of uh, common leopard based on, because cloudy leopard has patterns on its body. Okay. Uh, even common leopard has patterns. So each individual has different patterns. Like we have, we have, fingerprints oh they have body patterns different so all all of the so based on those leopard, image uh -huh. yeah so all of the clouded leopard uh, have the different patterns so that's how you recognize okay this one different, is that. different and different, do you like totally distinct. beside yeah. uh doing the photography like a uh, trap photo trap do you also like uh catch catch any any of them or put a radar or any of those things you mean you mean yeah colors or colors something? yeah radar colors i, I I, I I plan to do that, but it's for some for some reasons uh, there's there's some difficulty in getting permissions when because uh, there are when we do research there are two two things we have to uh, take care. One is whether we are handling the animal mm -hmm. or we are not. So there, oh. there are two. Either we can handle the animal. So putting collar is handling the animal. We have to trap them, we have to anesthetize them, and then we have to put collar. So that is called invasive uh, research. So we handle, we disturb them. 
but when we put camera traps when we collect poops okay. then that's non-invasive we don't handle the animals so we don't uh, stress them uh, with uh, what we are doing so uh, the best thing everybody wants to do is like sewing uh, putting uh, trapping clouded leopard, handling them and putting a profile picture in Facebook, that's a different thing. But a, a researcher, he or she, if, if information is readily available, they, then they don't want to handle the animal. That's not good for them. So that's the last option of getting uh, information. So mostly we'll try to do with scats, mm -hmm. camera traps and other stuff. But there are some, some information which are not easily available uh, then then we also do the coloring track them check which areas they are using okay and all those stuff yeah, so. you kind of you kind of bring an interesting point in that sense like whenever we think about uh researcher environmentalists they are, we always think like they're going with the tranquilizer they sedate the animal they put the micro track yeah. chip yeah. and then let him go yeah. and then collect yeah. data in a computer but that's more like invasive like uh that's yeah. the animals will get trauma or some uh, like they'll get shocked and they'll try they'll change their behavior i think like if they some things like invasive yeah. Uh, yeah yeah things happen and uh for us like oh the like the environmentalists do it so people are like oh the, go more closer to the animal they feel like oh they can people do it anyway and that uh that is not a best way as you said is that's like uh that's the last option uh like more i think you the way you said it so there are so many information which uh we can we can collect without putting the color zone mm -hmm. so we can know which time they are active through camera traps uh like for clouded leopard it's really 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 shy animal so i told you that we did a camera trapping in 2017 mm -hmm. we got only uh out of we had 53 cameras uh five were stolen so out of 48 uh, camera traps we got a uh, clouded leopard in only three out of huh. 48 we got camera camera trap clouded leopard pictures in only three camera traps so that's it's it's very shy. Okay, so those camera traps work when some something passes nearby, right? It's like motion sensor. Yeah, something passes in front of them. Yeah. Okay. Out yeah, of this, you sensor. only got only three. So three. Did you put like very few? That's very few. <laughs> did you put it on the since it's arboreal? Did you put it on the top of the trees as well? Or? No, it 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 is arboreal, but uh, it spends a lot of time in trees. But it do. Uh, come down to the ground also mm -hmm. so it's not only monkeys that it feeds on so it feeds on squirrels it feeds on uh, barking deers uh, which work uh, on the ground uh, and even wild boar mm -hmm. and smaller uh, himalayan cerros and all those uh, species so it there's a lot of evidence that clouded leopards they come down to the ground and spend quite a lot of time uh, on the ground also but it spends a lot of time on uh, most uh, time on trees mm -hmm. but we put it on the trail walking trail uh, there have been many studies where people they have put camera traps on ground mm -hmm. and they have uh, estimated uh, the population density uh, of uh, cloudy leopard also they have done so there's a good evidence that it can be done but so, in our case we uh -huh. couldn't do probably it's 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 the site specific thing Okay. Yeah. So, uh, like, has there has there been enough research about like uh, how many clouded leopards are there in Nepal, like uh, beside uh, the Annapurna area? Uh, uh, there was recently a research in Langtang National Park. It's east. It's just north of Kathmandu city. Uh, there was a research in two thousand and fourteen fifteen. Uh, before uh, we did our Annapurna uh, survey, so they have come up with some uh, information. There was one information. Uh, otherwise, not many research have been done. Okay. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of opening for that. And uh... they, 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 I think they have come up with. Um, I have read that paper, but I, I just forgot the number. It could be around three to five uh, individual clouded leopard in their area. Okay. In the area where they 
yeah. camera trap. These are these are all interesting things. Like uh, trying just trying to get the animals uh, number is so difficult, and you need to put uh, like uh, do extra research, and that's uh, way more hands in experience as, as I think. So uh, like a I'm, uh, I want to get back to you as a conservation biologist. You you just uh, like talked about like a little, little of your work with the clouded leopard. So like uh, beside clouded leopard, like oh, you being part of the NGO and you uh, being a researcher, conservation biologist, like how do you think like uh, as Nepal is, uh, as you know, like Nepal is a very uh, wildlife and diverse uh, country. Like, uh, do you think your research and your works has uh, benefited like uh, in helping out the animals or like uh, helping out the environment? Or do you feel like uh, there's a lot to be done? Like, how do you consider your work so far? Um, it's a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> actually, we, we have tried our best, mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of things uh, still to be done. Like, uh, I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, in 2009, uh, 2008, we went to a place called Humla district. Uh, it's in the northwesternmost corner of Nepal. So it's close to Tibet, uh, close to Mount Kailas, which is like very famous. So. I went there in 2008 and then we talked with local people there. They said that uh, wild yak, a species called wild yak, everybody knows domestic yak, but very few people know like, that there are wild yaks also. So they said wild yak are found uh, in that area. So it was really interesting because what we read and what we knew was that wild yak was extinct from Nepal. Mm -hmm. So. But we, from, from local people, we knew that uh, wild yak were still there. So we planned to do an exploration there. In 2013, uh, we did an exploration. We found some evidence of wild yak. And in 2014, 15, our friends, we went and we uh, had like uh, some people, they also got the picture of, uh, uh, sorry, wild yak. So interestingly, the government, uh, government they were also interested in uh, like this area this uh, humla uh, and uh, then in 2016 the government they asked us to do a detailed survey even the socio-economic survey and biodiversity everything so and also suggest what what could be done for the area so we did that survey and uh, submitted the report we are yet to hear <laughs> from the government so they, they 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 initiated the study that was a very nice thing but the report i don't know what has happened with the report uh, we are hopeful that the government will uh, do something uh, so they we have suggested that some some level of protection should be uh, provided in that area mm -hmm. and uh, and and the like there's uh, the area was also declared as one of the important birds and biodiversity area, okay. IBA. So Nepal has 37 important bird and biodiversity areas. So that area is one of them. And it's because of um, the work we did. Okay. So, so there are some instances where we see, uh, we see the success of uh, what we did, uh, the result of what uh, our work. But in some, some cases, like, a lot has to be done before we see something as a result, positive result. So uh, it's really difficult to uh, pinpoint uh, that all of our work has uh, uh, provided good results. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a, it's a process, long process. And in some, in some cases, it shows results, positive results very early. Mm -hmm. uh, Humla was uh, one of the such, such um, uh, process. But there are some like cloudy leopard research and conservation. It's still long process. I think it'll uh, take time mm -hmm. to uh, uh, for the results. And there, there's one uh, interesting uh, result also for cloudy leopard also. Like in the area where we are doing the local government. Now we uh, Nepal has three levels of government: local government, uh, state government, and uh, federal government. Mm -hmm. So the local government in that area they have. Uh, declared clouded leopard as 
the special uh, wildlife of that municipality, okay. Madhi Rural Municipality. So they have give, given the official, uh, they have declared cloudy leopard as an official uh, wildlife. So that, that's a very um, good thing. And that's because we have been doing work on cloudy leopard and trying to convince them. Mm -hmm. So that's one uh, positive result. From, yeah. from our work from from like uh just getting to understand you like from my perspective like uh you do basically you love nature and uh, you do your work trying to preserve it try to get those ex uh, like uh, all the data and uh, all the information to the public and to the government and try to work with government try to f uh, preserve it as a, as i said i asked you a hard question is like uh like what what basically have uh, yeah. to put it in an uh, easier term like what basically have you done that you find like you have saved uh, like for your work was it validated or not like you just explaining like okay you try to work with government and try to save the animals means a lot like uh, I don't know if you want to say like it directly or not but I feel like uh, all the environmental uh, biologists like you and like all, all of the friends I know they are like basically the protector of the animals, <laughs> animals and the natural ecosystem. Like you, are, you guys are like the big heroes. Yeah, you don't want to say it. You just work and you just do the data. You take photos. But from our like outside pers uh, perspective, you guys are the real heroes trying to protect the nature, trying to keep the biodiversity alive, and not be and just to give us give us the warning. Like okay. Uh, the the human activity or some natural activity is impacting the lives of uh, all of these animals and areas around and give the public the information like what is happening so that we don't lose any uh, other animals that we don't get to see hopefully we don't get to see another animal being extinct so that's why like uh, i just wanted to get your perspective you are like uh, just talking to you, you are really focused on your work. And uh, like for me to just uh, understand you, it's just like, okay, you, you'd really go into detail. <laughs> and uh, like your work means a lot in the outside of this. All of those data and all of the tracking, everything encompasses at the end is like, you guys are really trying to protect the animals, right? Yeah, uh, no, not just the animals. Uh uh like uh uh like cloudy leopard let's say or or leopard uh, what they do is they are like top predators so they they uh like tigers let's say uh -huh. uh, tigers are the top predators apex predators so there's nothing above them mm. so in nature uh, except humans <laughs> except humans nothing can kill a tiger one on one okay so uh, tigers are the top predators. They 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 regulate the prey population. Like they feed on uh, spotted deer, they feed on uh, gaur, they feed on wild boars, and all those uh, prey animals, and keep their population in check. Mm -hmm. So it's not just when we look at uh, when when you see you you or other people, they might think that I'm just protecting the cloudy leopard. Yeah, my my uh, uh, my objective is to conserve cloudy leopards, but it has ripple e effect. Like when we conserve tigers, then then they regulate the prey population. If the prey population goes beyond the uh, beyond the numbers that the ecosystem can hold, then then the there will be other effects. Like uh, a lot of prey species, they feed on grass mm -hmm. and uh, leaves and those they, they will feed overfeed so so yeah when we look at directly it's like conserving one species or one individual but it has like this ripple effect yeah all the top like so the, it's like saving an ecosystem yeah it's not just like uh as you know it's like uh, there's tiger there's deer deer eat grass and other grass uh, population so if one is let's say there's no tiger for example then the deer population explodes because there's no prey, like a predator. Yeah. So the, the explosion yeah. of one, per, yeah. like, say, deer population will destroy the, 
like smaller populations of uh, like rodents and other. Yeah. yeah, so th there's a massive chain of uh, chain reaction if one population or one species is uh, more or yeah. even less. So like you, uh, you guys are basically yeah. trying to keep that in number, keep those uh, information out there so that if there's need of human inter like interjection, like I I've know, known about like uh, in America at least, there's a big problem with uh, Burmese python in Florida and uh, lion, lion fish in a lot of the rivers. Like the population is increasing because there's no predator. And uh, people usually go like, um, go and kill out uh, all of the uh, python. They just go and kill. In care, like of course, uh, everybody would say killing isn't bad, but when there is like uh, when there's no prey or like the, there's no predator for those snakes, Burmese snakes, the the snake population is dramatically increasing and killing off all the uh, like smaller species. So same with the, in Nepal too. I guess you guys are like basically trying to protect the what is the balance there. Yeah. Yeah, that is the thing. And uh, but uh, the example you provided, it's a, a little different because Burmese python, mm -hmm. it's it's not native to US. Yeah. So it was somehow it's it's an exotic species. Yeah, exotic species. So it's not uh, native to US. So it doesn't have a natural prey in in US. Mm -hmm. So the population explodes. There are so many other examples like Himalayan thar in New Zealand. Uh, they some some. During some time, some people they uh, transported Himalayan thars to New Zealand, and there's no what big predator the there. Thar? So Himalayan thar, they have like the population has Himalayan thar. It's it's a uh, it's a goat species, <laughs> wild goat species. Okay. Sorry, I, I had to explain that. Yeah. No, no, uh, so it's no, a, uh, I had no idea it was a Himalayan goat, wild goat species. Uh -huh. <laughs> Goat species, so it was taken to New Zealand, and New Zealand doesn't have a big uh, predator, so it doesn't have a big carnivore. So the population of Himalayan thar it's like increasing like crazy. So uh, now what they do is they they I think I've heard about uh, that they provide this quota, hunting quota, and okay. people can hunt. Yeah, uh, that's for exactly somebody. where it goes. Nepal. So I... they that way they keep keep the the population in check, yeah. I guess. So I, I know like uh, I'm talking over you a little bit because there's a little break in inter internet. Like, uh, so for the audience, it's just a little, we're trying to work. <laughs> Mr. Yadav is in Nepal and I'm in the uh, United States, Dallas, and it's it's hard to communicate with a little bit slower internet, but we're dr trying to do the best we can. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, like uh, I just said about uh, those invasive species, does like uh, from your study, does ne did Nepal ever have an invasive species come in to the wildlife? In in mammals, we don't have in mammals. I am not sure about uh, any species, mm -hmm. but there are some other species. We we have plant species invasive, and we have like some snail snail species mm. uh, there are some invasive species plants and small insects in mammal i'm not sure there are there are not not many invasive species okay. mammal wise i mean that's good <laughs> yeah yeah good good yeah if there's any it's like a, if there's not balance of species the the how do you call the native species get destroyed off like uh, because the the yeah. Invasive species have some kind of advantage over the native ones. Yeah, yeah. I I I watch too many natural geographic and uh, discovery, so I'm a little bit versed on like what happens at least on nature wise. Not like ex uh, like I have to, like nobody should take an how to say me an example or take my information as a fact. But I feel like oh I know something about the nature and it's always fun to be involved in the natural things and all of those. Uh, natural channels and it's always fun and like what what motivated you to be an, a conservationist uh i think it, it was um uh, from from my heart i think i was always a conservationist i was always a conservationist i didn't realize it uh, till i till i did my uh, master's thesis 
I never realized I was a conservationist, but in my heart, I was always a conservationist. So when I did my master's thesis in uh, human and leopard conflict in Mustang district uh, in Nepal, so that time I realized that this is what I always wanted to do. I, I, I didn't know that. I didn't pursue it as my passion, but it came towards me and I realized. And since then, I have never looked back. Uh, and and I, I feel satisfied doing yeah. what I'm doing. No, you're doing amazing. Like uh, all of the researchers, uh, you having a team and working on, those are really interesting. And you said like uh, you did a master thesis on human uh, human tiger conflict can you explain a yeah, little bit about that like in human leopard. area so yeah. human leopard oh, leopard, leopard it's not not tiger but leopard yeah so it's it is uh, like leopard is one of the m most adaptable cat species so uh, like cloudy leopard they need some kind of specific habitat they need uh, forest with bigger trees and they need big trees because they they live in the trees uh, and they don't like to come towards human settlement they don't like scrublands grassland but but leopard common leopard mm -hmm. is a different species it it's very adaptable it it can uh, live around human settlement it can live in dense forest it can live in scrublands it can live in even it is even found in uh, Middle East deserts of Middle East. In the, so in the it's a very adaptable well. species, and uh, hmm? in the Sorry? deserts as well. So so uh, yeah, so it's it's a very adaptable species. It has a big range. It's in it's found in Africa also. It's found in Asia. So it has a big range. It lives in all kinds of habitat. It lives close to human settlements. There's a documentary called The Leopard of Joy, J-W-A-I, The Leopard of Joy. Joy is a place in uh, India, in Rajasthan. So I, I recommend you to uh, try to uh, uh, watch that uh, documentary, yeah, I'll, I'll The watch. Leopards of uh, Joy. It's a really interesting. And uh, like, what about the human conflict? The Leopards of Joy, J-W-A-I. Oh, what about the conflict that you said about like uh, the leopards within the Mustang area? Okay, yeah, I, I'm coming to that. I'm just uh, making the background. Oh, please do. <laughs> okay, so yeah, they they uh, they live close to human settlement. So they are one of the cat species which mostly come into contact with humans. So so conflict is inevitable for leopards. They like. They, they are so adaptable, they uh, live close to human settlement and humans are powerful. So leopard is also in, in its own term, it's, it's an apex predator. So when these two species come close, uh, they're bound to be happen some, some they're bound, there's bound to be uh, some conflict uh, to happen. So in Mustang, uh, we went, and we found that uh, uh, there's some some conflict uh, happening. So leopards trying to prey on uh, yaks, smaller yaks, and mountain goats, uh, the domesticated mountain goats, Changra we call it. Mm -hmm. uh, so they try to prey on those species, which uh, the local people they have raised. They, they, they rear livestock. So uh, livestock rearing is one of the important uh, uh, occupation for them, important source of income. So leopard uh, tries to feed on those uh, uh, livestock. So that's how uh, people get into conflict with uh, leopard. Okay, so uh, uh, like, uh, I don't know, hopefully there have not been any, like, uh, like no uh, lives lost of people. But like, uh, was there any kind of like stories of like uh, any kind of tragedies or what was the real, like uh, were people scared of the leopards or like how did they deal with them? In that case, I think conflict was low. Okay. In, in that particular area, conflict was not that high. Leopard used to uh, feed on livestock, but it was not big. For, uh, for one family, I, I have to check the figure 
because I didn't, uh, it's, it's a long time, I haven't <laughs> looked at my thesis. So it should be around uh, three, four thousand Nepali rupees per uh, family. So the cost, cost of conflict. Oh, so that's, a, that's they, a lot for, for people especially. Yeah, yeah. For some people, it's it's quite a bit. For uh, for some people, it's very high. Like there are many uh, families which uh, which live in income of less than uh, one US dollar. So that's quite a, okay. a lot for some uh, families. But still, that is uh, not very high compared to some other places where, like uh, in in. Uh, in a district called Tanahu, mm -hmm. uh, in the last two years, more than uh, around 10, 11 people have been killed, mostly uh, children. So that's that's even bigger cost, you know. Yeah, it's, it's even by bigger. The conflict is even bigger. By leopards, yeah. I know, like uh, the leopard are really well adapted as you said uh i've seen videos of a lot of leopards in india getting inside the villages and people are have like constant conflict and the leopards get killed or at least the people get hurt and uh i don't, I don't hear much about the tiger them like tiger itself coming into the human settlement but leopards too are more common right yeah tigers also they, they also come but uh, the thing is tigers are found uh in very small patches so but leopards are found all over Nepal. Oh. So there's, there's more when a species number is more than there more incident uh, will happen for, for that species. For tigers, they do come to human settlement, but like there's a lot of organizations working in tiger uh, conservation and tiger research and a lot of compensation is also uh, provided by the government uh, for anything lost livestock or human uh, lives for for leopard also government has started compensation scheme so that's a, a but good why thing do government uh, so do people if they, like i say like why, some, why, why, yeah. sorry, a little uh we're having a little feed, uh, feedback or like conflict uh why do government uh usually like give compensation if uh, say tiger or leopard kills some uh, somebody tiger it's an important species it's important for tourism it's important for nature itself mm -hmm. so and there's a lot of uh, conservation funding for uh, tigers so we don't want to lose tigers because they are iconic you know yeah. so if if there's no compensation if there's nothing provided by government or any other organization people are bound to retaliate and uh, kill okay. tiger in retaliation so the compensation is provided to uh, to uh, to to not let people do that. To not let people kill uh, tigers or common leopard in retaliation. It makes sense, but I don't know how much people would be like, okay, I got the money, but I'm not going to retaliate against uh, some animal that killed something. But the uh, the best practice probably would be to not have that uh, conflict at all, right? Yeah, best is, but like I'll give you an example of Bhutan, you know. Bhutan is like, it has around 700,000 people. Yeah, probably 700,000 people. Mm -hmm. So even Kathmandu Valley, it has like 4 million people. Okay. So Bhutan as a country has like five times less people than uh, Nepal. Still, there's a lot of uh, like forest is connected and there are very few people still uh, people get into conflict with uh, tigers or leopards there consider nepal we have like uh three, 30 million nearly 30 million people yeah. so this wildlife they live in islands leopards and tigers they live in islands surrounded by human villages yeah. so just just uh, reducing conflict to zero that's that's not possible mm -hmm. that's not possible at all conflict is bound to happen uh, just just what we can do is make sure that the conflict is minimum mm -hmm. and if if happens if conflict happens 
then try to make sure that people would not retaliate. So okay. uh, compensation mechanism and then uh, in some places there are insurance scheme also like uh, uh, other organizations or external organizations or government, they provide uh, uh, money for uh, these livestock herders or others to insure their livestock so that if a tiger or a leopard kills their livestock, mm -hmm. they get their money in full from insurance company. Mm -hmm. so that they don't uh, kill leopard or tiger so, so these are some of the uh, yeah yeah so uh as you said the the government basically provides as insurance or uh if so just to protect that tiger just that the people would not retaliate because the tigers have tigers leopards or any other animals have a big natural like uh they're natural wild animals and you don't want to disturb the wildlife there, but also they have a, I guess the tourism factor where the government makes money out of saving the animals so that the tourist comes, visit the, those places and uh, the, the, uh, the, the fees would uh, like benefit everybody. So uh, like how much, like uh, do you think like uh, the tourism have impacted positively or negatively in your experience? Because from the government side, it's definitely is beneficial, but as ecology side, like uh, as an environmental side, has, is tourism beneficial uh, for the wildlife or has it been like uh, something you're like, oh, we have to do it anyway kind of thing? Um, it, it it depends. Uh, it depends upon uh, how we are uh, managing the numbers of, of tourists. Mm -hmm. uh, if if it's too high, uh, so there there has to be a proper assessment before uh, starting this safari and all those stuff. There has to be a proper assessment, like how many uh, jeeps, safari jeep, can uh, enter uh, a national park in one day. Mm -hmm whether it can be uh, whether it is good to uh, uh, operate them during night also or is it only during day and how many tourists should go and ethical distance like to a lot of tourists they go with their cameras uh, and i have seen uh, in in some places i have seen like a safari jeep huh? chasing a rhino so that those those things should be yeah, that that's not good. That's that's really bad, and uh, government should regulate all those stuff. But uh, if we regulate a certain number of tourists, certain number of safari jeeps, then tourism also acts as deterrent to poaching. In yeah. uh, deterrent to poach, poachers. In in Africa, there have been studies which shows that uh, having tourists in a protected area. Mm -hmm acts as a negative uh, uh, negatively to the poachers so poachers tend to not go to the areas where tourists uh, frequent yeah like uh, i know i know about a lot of stories uh, in at least in africa what they do is they because they employ people the, there's a lot of tourists there's a lot of business booming uh, the people who were supposed to be poachers because they had no other means to leave they're just like doing what they can to survive, you know, even, even though those are bad deeds, they actually have a job. And when people say they conserve the area, like uh, when the conservation is done, the tourist comes, the money flows as well. So the people leave their poaching for a better job, a risk-free job. Like uh, poaching has its own uh, like risk, like there's a lot of risk for the people because uh, basically government usually try like either set up like a police or armies they can hunt down the poachers themselves which is like a risky job for them but having uh, like a better secure job uh, like protecting the animals themselves i think ensures uh, the lives like uh, ensures the safety of the animals as well as the tourists can come and visit but uh, i'm going to put you in a really really interesting uh, conundrum i'm going to uh, like i know there's a as you said, you give, give an example of in Africa, the tourists comes, they spend money. So what do you think about, like uh, you've seen the, the rich, uh, like really rich people posing in, in front of the lion, dead lion, a dead giraffe, right? You have seen those, right? So uh, those are, some of them are really horrible. Like the picture themselves are super horrible. 
like and nobody wants to see them but there are some good parts of it in that sense because they uh they charge money with tourist say a lot of money with tourists to kill say a lion and th- these are like more common things and the the tourist comes and kill the lion but the thing is they plan it out the lion which is uh, like really being dominating or the lion which is killing other cubs so they have to get rid of the lion somehow so they just uh, allow tourists to kill those and take pictures which i find myself like it's really offensive to just take picture with the animals you just killed but <laughs> if it's benefiting i i'm like in a i'm in the middle with like if it's benefiting the other animals then there's a positive things it can be done like how do you as a, a biologist feel that being an option uh i have two opinions on this uh first one is i am i am kind of like uh really by nature mm-hmm. by nature i'm very uh like how to say this uh i'm not very positive towards hunting in any way mm-hmm. that that's my my actual nature but uh over the years i have read uh papers i have looked at the documentaries i have discussed with a lot of conservationists big names and i have come to conclusion that that's one way uh a population can be managed and some kind of funding is also but but that has to be properly done mm-hmm. that has to be properly done if if that is not properly done then the animal will be killed the money will not go to conservation so it has to be uh, there has to be a proper assessment before carrying it out and there has to be proper system mm-hmm. proper system in place which like, with check check and balance and everything otherwise like what happens in africa is they choose a lion which uh, will no longer breed mm-hmm. very uh, adult male lion which has uh, like uh, which doesn't have uh, which can't uh, uh, contribute biologically to the population to the uh, lion population so they basically choose those kind of and they never and and the hunters they also they don't uh, uh, kill uh, Uh, females they like males with big mane mm-hmm. so that's what is done and some some hunters they pay like around 35 to 40000 us dollars pay, for a single way, lion they way more but yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. E- even more e- yeah. in some cases so that's that's general 35 to 40000 so so that money but there should be a proper system of how that money goes to whom whether it is Uh, only taken by the safari people and the tour operators and all those stuff and doesn't go to a uh, community who actually conserve those species so the, there's a lot of and in in place like nepal in countries like nepal i don't think that trophy hint- hunting system would work mm. yeah <laughs> it's really difficult uh, there's a lot of things going on uh, corruption and bureaucracy because of all those things trophy hunting i am not very positive uh, for nepal in yeah. in ideal system ideal yeah it 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 will work uh, positively for conservation yeah like if there is extreme poaching like a, that's uh, but, yeah. yeah yeah like a nepal has been really successful with uh, preserving the animals because uh, as a tourist country like we don't need those kind of uh, option to kill the animal to get that money to preserve because tourism has themselves like a uh, tourism has been able to support nepal and preserving animals from what i've uh, learned but uh, do, uh like how 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 has the uh, the preservation or like how has the conservation of na- your activity and others uh, environmentalist and other government agency been like had they been successful or had there been like a backdraws of like a with the people who poach like uh with the regarding the are there more poachers now or how has those kind of inv- uh, information been like uh are there more poachers now that is uh, that is very difficult to tell but uh, uh nepal does have uh, some like very uh, nice success stories especially in 
uh, tiger conservation in in uh, one horned rhino conservation and uh, like uh, the, those those two are uh, very uh, good work and there there's a good uh, work being done uh, for red panda conservation also uh, though there are still there are a lot of incidents of red panda being poached but uh, but there's some organization which are doing good work uh, and like government uh, is also translocating uh, Asian water buffalo uh, mm -hmm. to Chitwan from Koshi. That's a very good thing because uh, a threatened species, if it's in only one one area, that's not good. Uh, <clears throat> if there's some disease, genetic disease, the whole population can be uh, wiped out. So it's good to have uh those some some population transferred to some other um, probable habitats mm. so that's uh, so the government is doing good thing and uh, uh considering considering other aspects of uh, the government like education and all uh, all other stuff i think in conservation government is doing uh, quite well in in nepal there, there's a lo always uh, a lot of room for improvement of course yeah. but uh, Whatever it is doing, it is going uh, quite good. Okay, that's, that's good news. Accept. That's a really great news to hear. And uh, like, beside the government, like uh, from your organization, how many different uh, non-government organizations are there like trying to preserve, or trying to get information and research for the different populations of wild animals in Nepal? Uh, I, I, I can't tell you uh, the exact figure right now because I don't know, but... Uh, 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 10, 15 organizations are doing a good job, I think. There could be many more, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, 10, 15 organizations are doing, I think, all right. They are doing a good job. Uh, like some organizations, they are especially focused on small mammals. Uh, one organization is focused on red panda. Okay. Uh, some are uh, focused on pangolins. So there are different organizations and many of them are doing uh, good work. That's really great news. Like uh, at least in Nepal, there's uh, you, like even for a conservation biologist or any other uh, field, people who are in research area, basically at least in Nepal as a third world country, there's a great uh, environment and all the tourism sector, but economically, a lot of people like you have to depend on uh, research and other as a job like there's not much i guess people's interest in conservation has to, like always been coming from their heart but economically for new people to get into this job field there's there's it's a it's a difficult job field right uh economically yeah. as well as the job you do like uh say for example any research you do like how many days do you go into that field and uh so you have to stay there and work on it since 2017 since 2017 i have not been in field for uh, such research uh, till now since 2017 but so till 2017 i would say like out of uh, 365 days i used to spend like uh, four months around four months in the field four months that's <laughs> So in the field as an in jungle? Yeah, yeah, in jungle. Oh my God. I'll return as a Tarzan by the end. <laughs> <laughs> so that's more like a, when you take the students and researchers for those kind of like a research project, you basically go there and stay there for a long time, right? Even with yeah. new students? No, not with students. When we take students, it's generally a one day hike. Okay. So uh, those are like setting up camp and making research are more for like with your team i guess yeah yeah we have like uh, porters we have local guides we have research assistants we have like then we go to the field we uh, walk along the trails we look for signs we look for poos uh, poops uh, and we look for uh, tracks of species and we choose sites we put camera traps and then uh, do birding, do birding mm -hmm. through binoculars, and then move our camp and do the same thing. Like it's 
Yeah, that's a that's a lot of dedication. It's exhausting. That you need. It is, ex <laughs> and all of those data. Once you receive it, like what what do you go like? Is there, uh, is there a place where you submit that data in national government like agency, or do you send that data to, say, like some kind of a world uh, preservation agency? What do you do with the data? Now, what we do with data is uh, we have to the raw data we keep uh the actual image and all but we have to submit to the government also mm -hmm. national government and then we have to write a report based on those uh, data and we submit that report to the government and uh, to the funding uh, agency also okay who who provided funding for that research okay. so we have like two three reports which we submit to government funding agency and uh, even even in some libraries university libraries and all those okay that's a, that's amazing that's those are like really intensive data and information that you need to collect from the field and uh, like what has like a, what has been your most interesting project that you have done like since you started uh, like getting into the bio conservation field the best project was uh, the humla project while yak i i talked mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. about that uh, project sometime ago. That, that was really interesting because uh, it's a place which is close to Tibet and the landscape is all rolling plateau kind of uh, landscape similar uh, to that of Tibet hmm. and it was really interesting uh, doing that work, being in that place uh, and uh, exploring things, talking with people and getting new information and it's like did you ever find any anything new in that sense like uh specifically for nepal we always hear stories of yeti and there's like expedition to find some kind of yeti a uh, new species okay and uh, those kind of okay. like any interesting okay. stories like have you ever heard of those uh, you mean i uh, my yeah. experience or what but I hear from other people. Or like from, like, at least from the researcher side, in the scientific world, uh, not about the folk people, but like some, something on okay. uh, your Nepalese, okay. like environmental conservation side, like some kind of research that are uh, like, like the folk tales. New species. Or anything, yeah. Okay, you mean some, okay. Uh, one was wild yak, I told you, it was like thought that wild yak has gone extinct from Nepal so we uh, rediscovered uh, wild yak in Humla and there's one interesting species called uh, spotted linsang uh, what is that? it's a small species like this mm -hmm. small species it's a carnivore species small this much mm -hmm. it's a carnivore it lives in trees also it comes in the ground um, what, what, what is it I can show to? you uh, um, Mm, I'm not sure if you would know about uh, other similar species. It's similar to weasel. Oh, okay. Those are carnivores, though. It's similar. Yeah, it's a carnivore, and it has spots in its body. Small animal, not very big. So it was for. It was like. It was not known to uh, science before. Uh, it, it was first described from Nepal. So, okay. spot, uh, like uh, scientists, when they first discover a species new for science, mm -hmm. which was never been recorded before, it is called new to science. So, that spotted linsang was uh, discovered from Nepal in 1820s, I think. So, it was first recorded from Nepal. And since then, like it was recorded from other countries also, like India and uh, Bhutan and uh, Bangladesh and all other countries. Then it started getting recorded. But since that first record, there was no other record of that species, no updated record of that species. Everybody was saying, okay, spotted linsang is found in Nepal, but they always used to refer to that the first record of for okay. science so, so since then there was no, no other record that. and some people would say yeah nobody had found that and some some researchers they uh, they wrote a paper in 1985 or something that they have seen the species but there was no photo 
So there was no authentic proof of that species still uh, occurring in Nepal. So when we did camera trapping in Annapurna in 2017, mm -hmm. uh, I was like, I was not totally sure that we'll get that species, but I was thinking that maybe it would be really good if we get spotted linsa. And when we went to, uh, when we were checking the camera trap at the last end of our uh, survey, when we were checking the cameras, we uh, found that there was the photo of this species. Can and you, oh, you actually and found the, the interesting the, thing was you found the image of the that spotted species. Linsa? Yeah. Can, is there, is there species, a way yeah. you could uh, send me that photo? Yeah. Sure, I, I'll send you. That that's interesting. <laughs> right now or? Oh no later. no go go ahead. like later on. I'll, I'll I, I can it send you later. You. Okay. Yeah sure sure. And uh, then the interesting thing was that that uh, uh, image was captured just like before we retrieved our camera traps, just two or three days before. Hmm. Like if we had gone, uh, if we had collected that camera trap three days before, then we would not have got that uh, species in camera trap. So that's what luck does. Sometimes you have to be lucky, you know. <laughs> okay, that, that's, that's interesting because uh, just imagine like uh, if you're able to discover like if there was no spotted lensing photograph, like is there a photograph the first time they discovered it or record i guess record of it they they, they didn't have uh, a photograph they painted it painted. the guy illustrated okay. in painting yeah just yeah. imagine if that was not so and the first time you discovered it <laughs> that would be pretty cool that that would be really cool <laughs> yeah like uh, just imagine like uh, for you to be working in the conservation area like the one of the coolest thing would be to discover new species or like maybe you uh, like maybe you saw uh, in your lifetime you might be discovering something else like that's in nepal because i know nepal when i was a little kid like uh, when i saw a dolphin in karnali river that was like wh why is there a dolphin that yeah. was like that was such a new information and i wanted i was i wanted to okay. learn and everything about it and that was that's what enthusiasts uh new people to be in the conservation area is like to learn about animals and plants uh, or like to learn about the nature is those kind of discovery and even your discovery might be inspirational to a lot of people and students to learn about those kind of things and uh, like for you like to be uh, working with the students and with the people and conservation like all the conservation government uh, organizations like what has been what has been like your most fulfilling thing for you it's it's a very uh, difficult questions like there are a lot of like a lot of uh, incidents when i feel like i am doing good work uh, but the most fulfilling is uh, the humla incident only when it was listed as one of the important birds and biodiversity areas oh. that was one incident and then when the Madi rural, rural municipality declared clouded leopard as their official wildlife that was also like because clouded leopard is very close to me you know uh, it's it's a it's my favorite uh, animal so when it was given some kind of official status yeah you're probably sorry? the foremost expert in clouded leopards in Nepal too uh, I, I won't say expert but I'm working on uh, uh, it because there's a lot of thing to uh, know about that species still so uh, expert is quite heavy word for me <laughs> i mean that that's good like uh, there's a lot to learn and that means there's more fun to be had for you so uh, i really wanted to thank you for like uh, giving us a lot of insight about the workings of your you and uh, all of the non-government organization friends of nature and all of your stories and uh, I would love to get, uh, like, uh, have you back on the podcast someday again. And maybe you'll be discovering something really nice. <laughs> That's your piece. But uh, thank you so much for Fingers talking crossed. with me. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely hope so. And uh, thank you. yeah, like, uh, thank you so much. And hopefully, we'll, uh, some of our talk within us uh, will uh, once posted. And if people listen to it and get inspired by your work and get inspired to conserve the animals, conserve the wildlife, 
that would be amazing i i i honestly hope uh, that uh, the the things the stories i told they they inspire a lot of people and many people they would uh, like uh, get interested in conservation and uh, thank you very much for providing this platform to uh, to tell people what uh, i do how i do and what inspires me and how we do things what is the status of uh, uh, research and conservation of wildlife in Nepal. So that it, it was really nice uh, uh, to speak these things. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, like uh, unfortunately, the internet's really slow. So it's a, like our conversation feels a little awkward uh, a few of the times. But it's it's absolutely cool because we got to listen to you so much information. And I know, like uh, I remember, like talking to you regarding the Lato Cosero Festival, and we never got through it. So uh, can okay. you say a few things about okay, that okay. and also give me all of your information if uh, anybody wants to get to know about your organization or anything about your work? Okay, Nepal All Festival, it's, it's a very interesting uh, kind of event. So it was inspired from uh, International Festival of Owls, which is organized in uh, Houston, Minnesota, US. So they organized International Festival of Owls. So we were inspired by that event. So we have been organizing. So it has three aspects, the, uh, the event. One is cultural aspect. So what we do is when we go to a place, we talk with people, we try to, uh, we try that people showcase their culture also. Uh, so it's not only about uh, conserving owls, it's also about conserving local people's culture. So if we go to a Gurung, Gurung village or any other village we try them to uh, bring their folk dance folk instruments and uh, even the local games the games which their ancestors used to play but they are not known uh, today so we try to revive those games revive the culture and then there's education aspect uh, also where we uh, uh, display information on owls interesting uh, information on owls uh, and uh, uh, like uh, documentary on owls, uh, we uh, have made like owl audio audio uh, audio calls of uh, many owl species, videos of owl species, and many other things related with owls. Only if you go to that festival, you'll feel it like owl is everywhere. So people learn about owls. People learn out about local culture. People learn about local games. So that's what uh, we try to. And if we only keep it like education wise, most people will get, will get bored. So that's why we uh, also included the cultural aspect, games aspect, so that people will enjoy the festival as a whole, not just, not just as an owl conservation education center but as an event as a festival yeah, that, that so that's why fun. we do that so that is a festival and and friends of nature uh, we are based in Kathmandu um, in Tinkune and uh, we uh, currently we are working on clouded leopard uh, research and conservation and wild dog Asiatic wild dog uh, research and conservation owl uh, conservation. Uh, uh, so when we are talking about owl conservation, we are also working on uh, owl conservation action plan for Nepal. So we are uh, coming up with uh, the action plan uh, for the next 10 years for owls. So it's in the final stage. Uh, we are working on it. Uh, so by the end of this month, we'll, uh, like that will be published. The action plan will be published. Uh, I know. So, well, yeah, can, that's what can we, we do. get uh, the information of those any websites or anything to get back to you uh, if anybody wants to connect to you like uh, okay yeah we uh, our website is fonnepal dot org www dot f o n friends of nature f o n f o n nepal dot org uh, we are in Facebook uh you can uh, check friends of nature in facebook friends of nature nepal in facebook in twitter 
in Instagram, in YouTube. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'll try to put the information all in the description as well. So it was really good, sure. great talking to you. And hopefully uh, we get to see more of your work and uh, more festivals. And hopefully you'll uh, be recognized uh, and all of your uh, like environment conservation, like all your team get uh, more works and uh, like save more animals. That would be a really great thing for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, you so much, much and hope to talk to you again.